Hello and welcome to Pints with Aquinas. My name is Matt Frad. Happy Christmas week, or it's about to be Christmas, so I guess happy last bit of Advent. Hope you all are doing well. In today's episode, I want to look at what Thomas Aquinas says in the Summa Theologiae about whether Christ's birth should have been made known by the means of angels and the star. We also want to take a look at what Aquinas has to say about the star. Was this actually a real star in the sky, or was this more of a vision? We'll then take five questions from patrons, and we've got some really exciting questions today. Uh, There's a question about Taylor Marshall, which I'll get to. There's a question about whether Aquinas argued for the legalization of prostitution. We'll touch on that. And then just for fun, I want to share with you how I discerned marriage with my wife, because one of the questions has to do with long-term relationships. And so I want to share that with you. I think it's a lovely story, and I'm very glad that I married my wife and very happy. I'm not sure if she's thrilled to, to be married to me, but I'm thrilled to be married to her. And uh, I want to share with you a photo from our wedding when I looked like, you know, a hundred years younger than I do now. So it's it's great to have you here. Um, Before we look at the text of Thomas Aquinas, I want to say thank you to Hallo, which is sponsoring this episode. Hallo is an app, a meditation app that will help you to pray if you are struggling with prayer. Or even if prayer is something you do do every day, you might want to check it out. Hallo.com slash Matt Frad, H-A-L-L-O-W dot com slash Matt Frad. There is a link in the description below. Hello uh, is this really sophisticated, fully Catholic app. As you can see, it's really well produced. Uh, they have sleep stories. So you can go to bed, have people read the scriptures to you, like Father Mike Schmitz and, and even Jonathan Rumi from, from The Chosen. You can It leads you through these little Lexio Divina prayers and things like that. So if you've been saying, yeah, I want to pray, I need to find more time, this could be the thing for you. So go check it out, hello.com slash Matt Frad. It's the number one downloaded uh, app in the United States, Catholic app, I mean. And anyway, so if you if you click that link, hello.com slash Matt Frad, you can sign up and get three months of their, their app for free. They have a h- bunch of free content. But if you sign up with hello.com slash Matt Frad, you get access to absolutely everything they've done. For three months, so you can decide if you want to get it after that. It's really good. Check it out. Hallow.com slash Matt Frad. As I take a sip from my coffee. By the way, we have uh, Dr. Scott Hahn coming on the show today at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to discuss why society is doomed without true religion. We'll talk about how Aquinas understood religion as a virtue as opposed to how we moderns understand it. Uh, We'll talk about a bunch of stuff. It'll be really fun. Hopefully, we'll take some questions if Scott is cool with it. So be sure to stick around for that. And if you don't, if you can't catch it at 1 p.m., just come back later because, of course, all of these live streams are available on YouTube. Also, hit the subscribe button and the bell button if you want to support this channel. We are really close to reaching 100,000 subscribers, and it would be super cool to do that, I think. So if you want to do that, you can do that. All right. I love this bit from Aquinas. I really do. I was reading it this morning. It comes from the third part of the Summa Theologiae, question 36. And it's here that Aquinas is dealing with a bunch of different things having to do with the nativity of Christ. And two of the questions I want to look at, as I say, is the fourth article, should God have made himself known? Uh, Oh, or rather, let's see. Is that the right one? No, it's not. Um, yes, it is. Whether Christ's birth should have been manifested by means of angels and the star. That's Article 5. It's fascinating how he argues for this, and it really speaks to how God loves us and communicates to us in a way that we can understand him. It reminds me of Oscar in the office trying to explain finances to Michael. And at one point, Michael says something like, how would you explain this to me if I was five? You remember that? And it's really lovely to know that God does not communicate to all of us in the same way. So you might be discerning God's will right now, and you're like, I just don't know. Well, the good news is God doesn't speak to you necessarily the way he might speak to me. He doesn't lead me to know what his will is and uh, to have confidence that it is that in, in the same way as he might with you. And that's really great. So if God wants something from you, he will communicate his will to you in a way that you can understand if you are open to receiving it. And that's kind of what Aquinas gets into here. So this comes from Article 5, okay? 
<clears throat> I love this just opening line. I think it's so beautiful. As knowledge is imparted through a syllogism, right, an argument, from something which we know better, so knowledge given by signs must be conveyed through things which are familiar to those to whom the knowledge is imparted. Right, right there. I just love that sentence so much. I'm probably going to tweet it out and no one's going to care because I don't know, man, I just love Aquinas. I think you guys do too, but I think a lot of people just don't really get how he speaks, but I just think it's so clear and, 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 and precise and crystallized. I love it. So think about that. As knowledge is imparted through a syllogism from something which we know better. All right, now think about that for a second. Like, what is a syllogism? We, uh, classic syllogism, well, let's think of the Kalam cosmological argument formulated by Dr. William Lane Craig, who we've had on the show, right? Um, if I was to say to you, the universe has a cause for its existence, that's not necessarily going to be immediately obvious to you if you haven't thought about these things. But if I give you an argument, if I say, well, everything that begins to exist has a cause, and the universe began to exist, therefore, the universe has a cause for its existence. Those two premises are more clearly known to you, or might be more clearly known to you, than the conclusion. Especially if I then explain from the premises what I mean, you know, how we have evidence, maybe through philosophy, and through the scientific method to think that the universe did begin to exist, you know? So he says, as knowledge is imparted through a syllogism from something which we know better, right? So I know, I know that everything that begins to exist has a cause. I know that more than I know that the universe has a cause, right? And I might know from science and philosophy that the universe did begin to exist in the Big Bang or something preceding it, right? And so I know those things. And so, okay, so I can now come to know that the universe has a cause for its existence, you know? Okay, so, so just like a syllogism helps us to know something we may not have known through things we know better or have more ready access to, so knowledge given by signs must be conveyed through things which are familiar to those to whom the knowledge is imparted. Right, so if God wants to convey something to you, he's going to do it through signs that you're familiar with. If you weren't familiar with the signs and what they represented, it would be a bit of a waste of time, I suppose, on God's part to present them to you. Now, says Aquinas, it is clear that the righteous have through the spirit of prophecy a certain familiarity with the interior instinct of the Holy Ghost and are want to be taught thereby without the guidance of sensible signs. Okay, so that's certain group of people, right? Whereas others occupied with material things are not going to be led right through the Holy Spirit necessarily, but he says are led through the domain of the senses to that of the intellect. And so here he gives examples, the difference between Jews and Gentiles. Aquinas says the Jews, however, were accustomed to receive divine answers through the angels through whom they also received the law, according to Acts 7.53. Uh, and the Gentiles, especially astrologers, will want to observe the course of the stars. And so this is why Aquinas is going to say that God revealed the nativity of his son in different ways. So different groups of people can have knowledge of this amazing event. Aquinas says, and therefore Christ's birth was made known to the righteous, like Simeon and Anna, by the interior instinct of the Holy Ghost, according to Luke 2.26, he has received an answer from the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Christ of the Lord. So presumably, this wasn't something that Simeon received through an external sign, but rather a prompting of the Holy Spirit. Okay, but what about the shepherds and magi? Okay, well, to them, since they were occupied with material things, Christ's birth was made known by means of visible apparitions. And since this birth was not only earthly, but also in a way heavenly, to both shepherds and magi, it is revealed through heavenly signs. For as Augustine says in a sermon on the Epiphany, the angels inhabit and the stars adorn the heavens. By both, therefore, do the heavens show forth the glory of God. All right, so listen to this because he sort of sums it up here. Moreover, it was not without reason 
that Christ's birth was made known by means of angels to the shepherds, who being Jews were accustomed to frequent apparitions of the angels, whereas it was revealed by means of a star to the Magi, who were wont to consider the heavenly bodies. Because, as Chrysostom says, our Lord deigned to call them through things to which they were accustomed. And that really is the sentence that sums all this up, isn't it? Our Lord deigned to call them through things to which they were accustomed. And I would argue he continues to do this today. So maybe you are a single lady who is discerning the convent or married life. Maybe you are a 50-year-old man who has been laid off you know, your job because of the whole COVID craziness and you're now looking for employment. You know, maybe you're discerning whether it's time to have another child or whatever it might be. Our Lord, right, has deigned to call you through things to which you are accustomed. It's not as if he speaks, you know, if he weren't to speak to you in a language or through, um, through things to which you are accustomed, I mean, it would be equivalent to God speaking a foreign language that you had no access to and then demand that you know what he's saying. And that isn't how our loving father relates to us. He doesn't sort of say, you have to do this thing, which is my will, but I'm not going to show it to you in a way that you'll understand. In fact, there's no way you can access it. You just have to guess it. Good luck. And I think that is often how we do think about God's will and and how we are to follow it. I mean, not always, but we're sometimes tempted to think that way. And I think this is a wrong way of thinking of how our loving Heavenly Father relates to us, His children. Okay, he continues. There is also another reason for, as Gregory says, to the Jews as rational beings, it was fitting that a rational animal should preach. Whereas the Gentiles, who were unable to come to the knowledge of God through the reason, were led to God not by words, but by signs. I'm going to turn my phone off because it just binged. Right? That's awesome. So, yeah, man. If, if you have come to a knowledge of God, right, through reason, then maybe you come to a knowledge of the, of the Christ child through the, in prompting, excuse me, the prompting of the Holy Spirit. But if you haven't come to a knowledge of God that way, like the Gentiles, then God's going to speak to you through signs in a different way. I love that so much. And as our Lord, when he was able to speak, was announced by heralds who spoke, so before he, so before he could speak, he was manifested by speechless elements. Again, there is yet another reason. For as Augustine uh or, or Pope Leo, says in a sermon on the Epiphany, to Abraham was promised the innumerable progeny, begotten not of carnal propagation, but of the fruitfulness of faith. For this reason, it is compared to the multitude of stars that a heavenly progeny might be hoped for. Wherefore, the Gentiles, who are thus, thus designated by the stars and are by the rising of a new star stimulated to seek Christ, through whom they are made the seed of of Abraham. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. The Gentiles, through Christ, are made the seed of Abraham, right? So in Genesis, where God says, like, behold, like, th- this is this is going to be your progeny. This is going to be your descendants. See if you can count the stars. And of course, we know if we read Genesis carefully, that when God says to him, count the stars, if you're able, he's saying that to him before the sun set. So it was during the day. <laughs> so it's not like we often think, Abraham standing, looking up at the stars and maybe counting, but it was during the day, so we couldn't see the stars. And God's point seems to have been, of, yes, you cannot count the stars, and nor will you be able to count, uh, you know, uh, your progeny. So I love that, that we who are Gentiles, at least I was a Gentile, right, uh, or my, my ancestors were, were made the seed of Abraham through Christ. All right, I want to talk more about that. I just want to really quickly touch upon this idea of the star. You know, um, was this star something actually in the sort of heavenly system? Is it something, for example, that astrologers might find proof of in a natural sort of way? Or was this a supernatural sign? 
And so Aquinas is going to say this is actually a supernatural sign. This wasn't a natural star. This was something supernatural. He, and he quotes Augustine. It was not one of those stars which, since the beginning of the creation, observe the course appointed to them by the Creator, but this star was a stranger to the heavens and made its appearance at the strange sight of a virgin in childbirth. Now, I won't go through all the reasons that he gives for this, but I feel like I need to give you some since I've brought it up. He quotes Chrysostom right away, saying, It's clear for many reasons that the star which appeared to the Magi did not belong to the heavenly system. Let's give a, let's give a couple, all right? First, because no other star approaches from the same quarter as this star, whose course was from north to south, these being the relative positions of Persia, whence the Magi came, and Judea. Secondly, from the time at which it was seen. For it appeared not only at night, but also at midday. And here they quote scripture to kind of give arguments for this. All right, so there's a lot more, but that's just the kind of basic answer if you're in interested there. You know, another, and you could think of an analogy with the Holy Spirit at, at Christ's baptism. Aquinas says, Wherefore, some say that as the Holy Ghost, after our Lord's baptism, came down on him under the form of a dove, so did he appear to the Magi under the form of a star. While others say that the angel who, under a human form, appeared to the shepherds, under the form of a star, appeared to the Magi, right? So there are a number of options here, but the consensus of the Church Fathers, and Aquinas is backing this up, seems to be that this was not a natural star, uh, but this was rather a vision. Okay, very good. Lovely, 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 lovely. Okay, I uh, want to talk more about following God's will, but I want to do that at the end of the episode where I share with you how I discerned marriage with my wife. But before we get to that, I have some questions from my patrons who I would like to respond to. So if you are a patron, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We have, um, you know, a bunch of stuff coming up, including this awesome uh, five-part video series on salvation history in early January taught by Dr. Andrew Swafford. You get a bunch of benefits when you become a patron. That's just one of them. I won't go into the rest. But if you are a patron, thank you. Here is... Oh, Let's take the first question last. So let's do it the other way around. Okay. Uh, Iona Moulton says, I don't know if you've discussed this on a previous podcast, but can you discuss St. Thomas Aquinas' apparent support for the legalization of prostitution despite his moral objection to it? Okay. I don't consider myself an expert on this. And if I say something false, please correct me in, in the comment section. Um, Aquinas, okay, so... Aquinas is drawing on Augustine, right, in saying that prostitution should be tolerated. Neither Augustine nor Aquinas are arguing for the morality of prostitution, of course. What they're concerned about is, should civil authorities tolerate it in order to prevent graver uh, social evils? Now, I'm not sure if I agree with them. So, but but let me just kind of, let's see if you can get the concept, right? Obviously, not everything immoral is illegal. You could think of certain things, certain actions that are immoral, such as masturbation or um, uh, disrespecting one's parents or blasphemy or something. Suppose civil authorities sought to implement laws against these sins. It would seem to me that you know, an incredible breach of privacy would have to occur, you know, for example, in trying to penalize masturbation, for example. So even though masturbation is a bad thing and immoral, you might end up, and it looks, I think you would end up doing more harm than good were you to try to criminalize masturbation. And so you might say, okay, well, civil authorities tolerate certain evils because if they weren't to tolerate them, a greater evil would come about. And that's Augustine and Aquinas's argument. Here's what Aquinas says in the Summa Theologiae. In human government, those who are in authority rightly tolerate certain evils, lest certain goods be lost, or certain, like privacy, or greater evils be incurred. Thus, Augustine says, if you do away, this is a quote from him, if you do away with harlots, 
the world will be convulsed with lust. And then Aquinas follows on and says, Hence, though unbelievers sin in their rights, they may be tolerated either on account of some good that ensues therefrom or because of some evil avoided. I um, This is a very complex topic, maybe more complex than, than you think at, at first blush. But I'm not... Look, we live in a civilization in which prostitution has been, at least in the United States, basically illegal. Uh, there are certain places I know in the States where it is not. So when someone sort of quotes Aquinas and says, hey, look, there's people like AOC and Kamala Harris, perhaps, who want to say that sex work is a, a legitimate thing. It's actually work, um, that it can be noble in some way. Uh, this is, a, I think this is a different argument, and Aquinas would say, no, it's not at all noble. But I tend to be on the, on the opposite side here. And again, I'm very new to this, so I don't mean to be flippant or to attribute to Aquinas and Augustine something that they might not be saying. But it would seem to me that to legalize prostitution would bring about way more evil than good. I mean, think about, I mean, Augustine's thing there. Like, if you do away with harlots, the world will be convulsed with lust. Okay, but, you know, in today's day and age, if you allow prostitution, think of the evils that would result. I mean, for one thing, we often look at law as a teacher. So if the law says, okay, smoking marijuana is now legal, we, many of us here, smoking marijuana is now acceptable and moral and okay. Same thing with same-sex marriage, right? Okay, it's now marriage because it's been legalized as such. And think about what would result from that. Suppose prostitution was, was now legal. I suppose it would then be regulated. And I suppose it wouldn't be much of a stretch to think that just just as now we have you know, legitimate massage places, you would have uh, these sort of uh, sanitized prostitution places. And so you could go to the grocery store and then you could go and see a prostitute and it, the advertising would be very slick and it would be all about like you deserve pleasure and you deserve what's best for you and we just want to help you unwind. Like it would be couched in a way that would lead you and me to think that this is a legitimate activity, you know, and it seems to me that that would be, that would create tremendous evil, you know, the breakdown of marriages, pregnancies that would revolt, result, uh, you know, children born without parents or killed in the womb, uh, the degradation of marriage. I mean, there would be so many evils that would result. And it would seem to me that even though a woman might say that she enjoys prostituting herself, I don't think we have to accept her word right? I think we could say, well, you're wrong to. If societies don't protect the least vulnerable, what are we doing? And it would seem to me that if a woman is willing to sell her body in order to make money, that she is vulnerable and that we should, we should seek to protect her. Uh, but let me share with you something that another saint said. And this is the patron saint of moral theologians, actually, St. Alphonsus de Liguori. And he offers an argument for why prostitution should not be legal. And by the way, in Aquinas' day, as well as in Augustine's day, my understanding is, you know, the Roman Empire, at least in Augustine's day, was a, is obviously a big thing. And you've got certain areas where prostitution was legal and places where it wasn't. Um, but here's what St. Alphonsus de Liguori says, and I really like this. This has to do with the evils that would result from prostitution being made legal. He says, quote, In lustful men, lust plants deeper roots through easy and frequent sex with prostitutes. And so when the frequency of this vice increases all the more, they do not cease committing pollution and heinous sins, that is, graver sexual sins, uh, than sex with prostitutes was supposed to prevent. No, 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 he says. And therefore, they do not abstain from soliciting upright women. On the other hand, when prostitution is permitted, other innumerable evils are added. And we can think here of just, there would be more prostitutes. Children would be corrupted. Marriage would be devalued. So let's leave it there for now. And uh, we might do a, f a fuller episode on this later on, because 
It is a complicated problem. And you might say, well, how is it a complicated problem? Well, because there are gray areas, right? Like there are, there's a website in which rich men say they're looking for a fling with a young girl. Rich old men are looking for a fling with a younger girl. And the younger girl says, oh, this man will do all these things for me. He'll buy me all these things. In exchange, I'll give him sexual favors, you know? That's obviously what's going on. Is that prostitution? You know, and you might say, yes, yes. Okay, so what What about when a man goes to a bar and he's dressed really nicely and he's, you know, throwing money around and it's very much seems to be the case that she's interested in him because of the money. Like, is that prostitution? And you would say, well, no, but... So I do think this this is an interesting discussion and it's one worth having, but those would be my thoughts on it. The third... Uh, question here comes from Zach Slayback. It says, how do we balance making disciples of all nations with not becoming too much in the world, especially once one has children? For more context, I am sympathetic to things like the Benedict Option, but it seems difficult to balance that kind of pulling back from the world with the imperative to evangelize. I don't have children yet, but I'm absolutely not thrilled about the idea of raising them in any existing Western secular culture. All right. So I don't consider myself an expert on many things, including this, but I would point this out that in my experience, when people criticize the Benedict Option to me, they haven't read it. They hear the Benedict Option and they think that the book is about creating Christian communities and isolating oneself in a healthy way from the degradation of the world in order to raise good children and have good Christian flourishing society or something like that. And that's part of it, but he's not at all saying isolate yourself. Uh, Rod Dreyer is clearly aware of Christ's last commandment and why it ought to be a priority of going into all the nations. So I would say that I think it's absolutely crucial that we begin to live within walking distance, I would say, to other Catholic families who we can, to put it kind of colloquially, do life with three or four families, it doesn't matter sort of where you are, but I think walking distance would be the goal. Not driving distance, walking distance. Uh, with families who understand the evils of that, that can result from technology use and these sorts of things. Other parents who want to re, you know, read beautiful things to their children, enculturate them in a Christian faith, train them in the ways of the Lord. And I think you would like to, once you have kids, to be around other families where that is the priority. I mean, it's one thing when I tell my son, you should not do that, you should do this. It's another thing entirely when I take him to a friend's house and their parents say the same thing to their children and to my son or daughter, and their children are also sort of beginning to walk in the Lord in this way. I mean, just the other day, my son went to a family's house, spent the night, because I trust the family. In the morning, the fa I, 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 they texted me and said, hey, we're taking Liam, that's my eldest son, to an abortion clinic to pray. And I was like, awesome, thank you, you know. So... Yeah, I think we want to raise healthy children uh, and and maintain healthy marriages. And the way to do that, I think, is going to be in small communities of Catholics who love our Lord and who have access to the sacraments and these sorts of things, so that we can then go out and rebuild the church. It's it's not a circle the wagons kind of mentality where we don't actually do anything. We're just super concerned about raising our children in this sort of puritanical sort of way and maintaining the traditions. I mean, that's part that's part of it. I mean, tradition is good, right? Purity is good. But I think um, I think those would be a few things that I would say. And that's 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 certainly what my wife and I are aiming to do. Um, so there you are. I'm not sure if that helps. Okay, here. Oh, here's a quote from John 1633 that might be a lovely response to you. Our blessed Lord says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So I just say that because I think it's important to note that, you know, even in the you know, first century, you know, second century, right, the epistles, you've got St. Paul saying things in his letters like, someone is sleeping with their mother-in-law, please cut that out. That's really gross. He doesn't say that, but you know what I mean? Or could you stop it with the orgies and the drunkenness? And he says it more forcefully than that. But the, the point I'm making is these things, these like awful things existed then. They do now. And I know in a more sort of um, anonymous way or in a way that's easier to access. 
but it's still the case that God has raised up saints throughout history, and he's continuing to do it today. Okay, um, okay, here's a question that came to me from Austin Sarabia. Uh, Austin says, if you were to have someone on your show which you may strongly disagree with, like Father James Martin or Dr. Taylor Marshall, what pressing questions would you want to ask and discuss? Okay, so I think for Father, and by the way, I'm not equating the two here, uh, nor have I ever said that I disagree with Taylor Marshall in the way that I disagree with Father James Martin or anything like that. But I think for Father James Martin, I would want to say, do intrinsically evil acts exist? such that the intention and the circumstances cannot alter them. They are evil because of what they are. And if so, do you think that homosexual acts are intrinsically evil or not? I think that's the kind of question I'd want to ask. Um, because he talks as if that may not be the case. I, I know he's put out some things that say he's in compliance with church teaching. But in many of the things he says, like he retweeted somebody. I, I chatted about this in my discussion with Ralph Martin who basically seem to call into question what the scriptures say about homosexuality. And it was somebody saying something like, okay, yes, the Bible does condemn homosexual acts, but is the Bible right? And it's, it's my quotes this in his book and, and even references it, that, 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 that Father James Martin retweeted this. Even if that's <clears throat> not entirely the case, he seems to speak in a way that would lead people to believe that homosexual acts and, and relationships can be legitimate and good and beneficial and beautiful, which is contrary to church teaching. So I'd be interested in just having him uh, uh, hash that out. If I was talking to Dr. Taylor Marshall, I would want to know three things. Um, and by the way, I don't ever really listen to Dr. Taylor Marshall. So this isn't me pretending I, I understand everything that he said or has said. I'm sure he says many amazing things, but the kind of the, the, the impression I get is that he's sort of, and again, this is not me accusing him of these things because I don't listen to him and maybe I'm wrong. So I'd want to know from him, is Pope Francis the legitimate Pope? Uh, I would hope he would say yes. I'd want to say, is the Novus Ordo uh, a legitimate expression, right? A, a, a legitimate liturgy? I would hope he would say yes. And I'd want to know, can a Catholic reject the Second Vatican Council? And I would hope he would say no to that. So I, I would want to hear Taylor Marshall say, Pope Francis, of course, is the legitimate pope. He might have all sorts of opinions about him, as I might, but I would want to know that he thinks he's actually, like, that the chair is not vacant, in other words. And I'm sure he does. I, like, again, this is not me saying I'm asking this because of something I've heard. This is just something I would want to know. Is, you know, can a Catholic reject the Second Vatican Council? I'd hope he would say no. Um, even if he thinks there were motivations from those in the Second Vatican Council that sought to sort of change church teaching, right? And then uh, is the, can I is the Novus Ordo just as legitimate as the as the Tridentine Mass? And I would hope he would say yes, even if he has an opinion on what is uh, more beautiful or something like that. So that those are the things I would want to ask him. Uh, and if you know, you can let me know below. Emma Wolfell says, as someone who is about to graduate college, how do I best stay connected to and learn about my faith even when all the resources at my college are no longer available to me? Uh, okay, uh, there are a few resources that I would recommend you checking out. And I don't know where you are on your faith journey, but one of these is sure to do the trick. I think podcasts like Pints with Aquinas is a good thing to stay connected to. I think Father Mike Schmitz does an excellent job on YouTube at answering questions having to do with the faith. You might want to check him out if you haven't already. And then I would tell you to go check out the Thomistic Institute. Thomistic Institute. Thomisticinstitute.org. Thomisticinstitute.org. Check it out. Yeah, they, they obviously have fantastic videos, fantastic lectures. So you can go here, and this is obviously more highfalutin than what we do here at Pints with Aquinas. More, uh, more sophisticated. So I, I would check that out. I think they are amazing, and I'm a huge fan. So that could be something that you do. Okay, uh, let's see. We have a final question here. So what did I just say, say to you? I said Father Mike Schmitz, Thomistic Institute. I guess it depends on the corners. The third one would be Catholic Answers. I'm a big fan of Catholic Answers. You might check them out. Okay, 
Final question has to do with tips for uh, dating long distance, which I want to get to. And I also want to share with you how I discerned marriage with my wife, because I think it'll help some of y'all who are discerning big things right now and are worried that you'll make the wrong choice. But before I do that, uh, I want to say thank you to Exodus 90. Exodus 90 is a spiritual exercise for men, where for 90 days, you in a small uh, group of men give up things you wouldn't want to give up usually perhaps and take on things you wouldn't want to take on. So you, you, you're not allowed to have warm showers. You have to have cold showers for 90 days. You're not allowed to drink alcohol for 90 days. You're not allowed to snack in between meals for 90 days. You're not allowed to have any like sugary sweets. You can only use your computer for work. Let me tell you, it is bloody difficult, which is why I would never recommend someone do this on their own. They should do it with a few men at least. It's just for men, by the way. Exodus90.com slash Matt Frad. I'll put a link below. Check it out. Because in 13 days, 12 hours and 46 minutes and five seconds, four seconds, three seconds. Imagine if I just did that for 13 days. Uh, <laughs> there's going to be an army of men from around the world who are beginning on January 4th, Exodus 90, so that they can finish their Exodus 90 time on Easter Sunday. So go to Exodus90.com slash, let's do it together, Frad, Matt Frad. Exodus90.com slash Matt Frad. Join my wait list, put in your name and email, and we will send you more information about it. But, you know, look, 2020 has been a difficult year, but that's no excuse not to take our spiritual life to the next level. So if you want to do that, go to Exodus90.com slash Matt Frad. Exodus90.com slash Matt Frad. Glory to God, man. Okay. Final question comes from. Let's see here. Where is it? Elliot Brubaker. Any tips for dating long distance? Yes, I have many opinions. Uh, So I would say that long distance relationships can work, but they need to be progressing. They can't stagnate where they are. In other words, if I, you know, it, well, let's say if you like a woman and then you get together and you decide that you are attracted to each other and you go back to her, your state, and she goes back to her state and you communicate uh, via the interwebs, but th- there's no actual plan of progre- like progressing in the relationship, right? There's no real talk of I'm going to come and see you, right, for a week or two or whatever, and then you'll come see me, you know, maybe, and then we're going to discern what step to take next, I think if that is lacking, then it's not a good idea, and I don't think it's going to work. Uh, so let me just share with you how, how I met my wife and how I discern marriage. Uh, I met my wife serving as a missionary in Net Ministries of Ireland, and I remember saying to one of my friends on Net, I said, I wish I was attracted to Cameron because she's like the coolest woman I've ever met. But I wasn't. You know, I just saw her as a sister. I wasn't. I wasn't attracted to her in that way. You know. Um, but, but gradually that changed and that was really cool. <laughs> um, we, we kissed in Ireland at a pub called the bleeding horse. I think I went back to Australia. She went back to Texas and we stayed in touch over email. And then, uh, you know, I really had to decide like, do I like this girl or not? You know, and I was actually discerning the priesthood. And so I wasn't sure what to do. And this gets back to our discussion today from Thomas Aquinas, like God is going to Reveal his will to you in a way that you can understand. He's not going to reveal his will to you in a way that, like, Father Gregory Pine would understand, but you won't. And then, too bad for you. He's going to speak to you in a way that you'll understand. And that's why I had to begin to trust, right? Because I love the idea, actually, of the time of joining the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal. Uh, I just loved them. I met with them. I went and lived with them just, I mean, for a weekend. Just stayed with them for a weekend in London, England. I was so attracted to them. And I thought, gosh, I, I just really want to be a priest. I just love the idea of giving up everything for the Lord, living this radical life, you know. Through discernment, I came to see that I was really afraid of marriage. And I was really afraid of being a bad husband in that I would be a poor provider. Because like, what am I going to do? I didn't have a college degree. Yeah, everyone in America, I do now, but everyone everyone in America has college degrees. Yeah, I've finished high school. Like, what am I going to do? I've got no skill. I don't know what I'm doing. So I hate the idea that I'm going to marry this girl, but then she's going to regret it because I don't have any money. I think another fear I had was I'm just going to be a bad dad. Like, I, you know, people, some people like love kids. You know, they like being around kids. They, everyone's like, you'd be a great father. 
you know, I don't know if I did. I'm like, kids are okay, I guess, but they're also loud and stuff. And I don't know if I'm super into them. So I was just afraid that I would make the same mistakes that maybe my parents made, you know? And they're good parents, but we all make mistakes, you know? Uh, and then finally, I just thought, like, I'd be bad at sex. Like, I just, I'm, I don't know how to do this. I'm going to be a disappointment in every conceivable way as a provider, as a lover, and as a father. I'm going to suck, you know? And this is just something I just started to realize through in my men's group and through spiritual direction. I started to realize that a lot of my motivation for looking into the priesthood was fear of being a bad dad, father, lover, right? And I, I was like, I can't. I can't make a decision based on that. I can't make a decision based on fear. And so Cameron um, wanted to come down and visit me in, in Australia because it's Australia and it's gorgeous, you know. And um, anyway, she, she came and uh, it, we were both afraid that we wouldn't be like attracted, physically attracted to each other. Like our fear was that yeah, it would be great if we liked each other. That would be really convenient because we're really good friends, but we're not actually attracted to each other. And that's going to be disappointing when we realize that. And holy smokes, <laughs> it didn't take long before we realized that we were very attracted to each other. I'll, I'll save that story for a different day. But anyway, at that point, I'm like, okay, something's happening here. You know, this is, this is awesome. She went back to America. Right, and I'm still like, even though I'm attracted to her, I still feel like okay, I'm looking at the Franciscan Friars that are a new website. I'm still discerning the priesthood and stuff like that, you know. And um, I remember speaking to a good friend of mine. His name is his name is Dave Dobblestein. He lives up in Canada. He's married to Lita Dobblestein. Say good day if you know him. Uh, Dave is a really, just a really wise man. He said a couple of things that just really resonated with me. He said, like number one, he said, okay, it seems like the Lord is calling your attention to a possible future with Cameron. And I'm like, well, okay. He's like, it sounds like the Lord's making a noise if you want. And he said, if you were laying in bed at night and you heard like a loud noise and you didn't know what it was, you would maybe be obligated to go and investigate what made the noise. Who's there? What's there? What happened? He said, something similar seems to be happening here. And I think you have a sort of obligation to look into this. That really helped me, okay? But the thing with me was, you know, one day I'd want to marry Cameron. The next day I'd want to be a priest. And again, I think a lot of it came from my fear of being a married man. And um, so I uh, I would like chat with her on the phone one day and we'd have a lovely conversation. The next day I'm on the Friars of the Renewal website again or some other religious order, like wanting to become a priest, you know? And one of the things Dave said to me is, you can't walk two paths at the same time because you'll split yourself in half is what he said. You can only walk one path at a time. Like you can't walk two diverging paths at a time. That was awesome. That, and the other thing he said to me, and that's what I've said to you in this video, is God is not going to speak to you in a way that you won't understand. And I think we're often so afraid of that. Again, that he'll talk to me in a way that like Father Thomas Joseph White would understand because he's super smart, but I'm an idiot and so I'm not going to get it. It's like, no, no, no. Like God is not like that. God is a loving father. He doesn't say, guess what? My will is for you, but there's no way you can actually find that out. And I remember that really helped. And um, so finally, I made this concrete decision to pursue my now wife, Cameron, and not pursue the priesthood. I'm not sure if that makes sense. And it sounds almost bad, doesn't it? To be like, I'm not going to discern the priesthood anymore. So that's what I actually went into my room and I pulled out my journal. And I think I said something to the effect of like, today I'm going to pursue Cameron Maida, was her name, you know? And today on the next page, I said, I'm going to stop discerning the priesthood. And that was my decision. And so it was one of those things where it's like, even if I felt the desire to like look into a religious order, I'm just not going to do it. I'm just going to choose not to. I'm going to like almost treat it like a temptation, you know, like, which again, I know sounds weird, but my, my deal with God was like, you will make it apparent to me. And I trust that you'll make it apparent to me if I meant to be a priest. So I'm just going to keep following this path and we'll see what happens, you know? So I went and visited her for two weeks, you know, in Texas. And my goodness, she's just so cool. And I'm like, I, I just love this woman. She's beautiful. So I went home to Australia and I sold my car and I sold everything and I quit my job and I bought a ring. I bought an engagement ring and I moved to America. And I was living south of Texas in the woodlands, you know, south of Houston, rather, in the woodlands. Cameron was working in Houston, you know, and I, uh, while I was there, you know, even I had some doubts like, gosh, oh, and I got this funny story I got to tell you. I, <laughs> I had heard 
a friend of mine say to God, if it is your will, I need these three signs. And he was just very demanding of God, you know, and, and it was like really outrageous signs, you know, and he said to me that every sign was shown to him. And he said, you are a child. You want to like tell God, like you need to show me this, you know? And I thought, okay, that sounds really good. So I did that. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what the signs are because they're embarrassing, but one of them may or may not have been a deer in the middle of the city. I wanted to see a deer. I wanted to see a couple of other things, you know, and long story sh short, I saw none of them, like nothing. <laughs> and one day after receiving Eucharist, I was kneeling down in my pew and I just like, God, well, like, what am I supposed to do? And I I'm not saying that God said this to me. But I imagined God saying to me, <laughs> um, do you want to marry her? And I went, yeah, I do. And it was as if God said to me, well, you're old enough and ugly enough to make this decision on your own. Now, that's a saying in Australia. <laughs> you're old enough and ugly enough to figure it out, you know. Now, as I say, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, attributing these words to God. I don't hear God's voice or anything like that. But it was, I was imagining God saying, like, we'll just make a bloody decision, you know, like, pee or get off the pot kind of thing, you know? So I was convicted. I was like, all right, I'm going to do it. So uh, that, uh, the next day, because I have that wedding ring, remember that engagement ring? I'd brought it from Australia. So the next day, I'm like, all right, like, I guess I should I should propose to her. So I, um, I called my friend. His name's Mark Bennett. So if you're in Australia and you know Mark, thank him for this. I gave Mark a call, you know, different time zones and whatever. I think it was early, very early morning. And I said, hey, I, uh, I've been thinking about proposing to Cameron, but like, I'm really afraid I'm making, maybe I'm making the wrong decision, you know? And I was just like running this by him. And he said to me, uh, he just kind of laid into me. He's like, what are you talking about, you idiot? She's better than you anyway. You, you need to hurry up and propose before she figures that out. <laughs> He's not wrong, but it still hurt anyway. So I, uh, yeah, so I called Cameron and we, 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 I, I proposed to her. We'll get into that at a different time, but I, sh I would say, like during my engagement, there was there was no, there was no doubting. I was like, I've I've made the right decision. So I don't know if that helps or not, but just to kind of get back to what Aquinas says earlier, and I know that he doesn't say it about discerning God's will, but I can't help but see it like that as well, right? Again, here's what Aquinas says: as knowledge is imparted through a syllogism from something which we know better, so knowledge is given by signs must be conveyed through things which are familiar to those whom the knowledge is imparted, you know? And so like, you know, you know, some people who are like, I just had this deep peace and that for them made sense. Or they would say, well, I came up with a list of pros and cons and the pros far outweighed the cons and it wasn't immoral and I sat with it and that was the decision I had to make. Or they'll say, I sought the advice of people wiser than me. I read scripture. I was opening myself up to prayer and I, I just felt like this was the right decision. I think that's okay. It's amazing when you read the scriptures, I want to talk about this at a later date as well, like sometimes the way in which they discern the will of God doesn't seem terribly spiritual. For example, I was reading Genesis the other day and Abraham is trying to find a wife for his son Isaac. And so he says to his servant, okay, he makes him put his hand under his thigh for some weird reason. I guess that's a way of swearing to him. Uh, he says, I want you to go to Mesopotamia and find a woman from my kindred for Isaac. He says, all right. And he says, well, what if I can't find someone? What if she doesn't come back with me? He's like, well, then you'll be released from the from the debt you owe me, but you need to go there and try. He's like, done. So the, the servant takes these other men, he takes these camels and all this jewelry and stuff, and he goes to Mesopotamia, right? And you think about it, this is a pretty big freaking deal. Who, who's he going to find to marry Isaac? Don't you think? Like, that's that's bigger than, like, what should I do this weekend? Or should I move house? No, he's finding a wife for Isaac. And what does he do? Well, he does this thing where he makes this deal with God. He's like, okay, so I'm at a watering trough. Okay, people are watering their camels and whatever. He's like, okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, the first woman who offers me a drink from the well and offers to water my camels, that's the woman. <laughs> and so he meets this woman, uh, Rebecca, and she does just that. And he's like, Boom. And he bows his head. He says he bows his head and worships God. And you're like, really? That's how you did it? It's not terribly spiritual sounding. And he even then goes back to Rebecca's father that night and he relays the story in a way that we might relay how God has spoken to us in the past. 
right? So the point of all of this is I think that God speaks to us in ways that we will understand. Uh, and so we can trust that we have a loving Father. And of course, we, we, should, we should seek spiritual direction when appropriate. You know, we should seek the counsel of people wiser than us. Uh, we should prayerfully consider these things. You know, is there a part of me that doesn't want to hear no? Well, what does that mean? What is that saying? We want to try to get to a place where we are open to whatever God's will is, yes or no, um, and sort of make a choice, make a choice. Anyway, my friends, I don't know if that's helpful. I hope it's helpful. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, at one o'clock, golly, that's like in an hour and a half, I'll be interviewing Scott Hahn on the importance of religion. Please do me a favor and click that bell. Uh, no, click the subscribe button, then click the bell. That way, YouTube will let you know whenever we put out a new video. That really helps the channel. And if you would like to become a patron and get a bunch of free things in return, like this beer stein. Ooh, I don't know why I'm making ghost sounds, but you get that. You get signed copies of my book. You get stickers. You get all sorts of things sent to you. You get access to all these online courses that we're doing. And you'll just help some big things that are about to happen, which I haven't yet announced. Go to patreon.com slash mattfrad, patreon.com slash mattfrad. That would help. God bless. Thanks.